guys and welcome to episode 126 of the OCDstories.com podcast. Now in this episode I got back on Harris Goldberg. So I got Harris on sometime last year. Uh, Harris is a scriptwriter and now director in Hollywood. He has co-written films such as Juice Bigelow, Male Gigolo. Um, and he also wrote the mental health film called Numb, which was based on his own experiences of mental health. And we go into the the kind of the insights behind those films, his OCD story, his journey in in the first episode. In this one, it's more of a wide ranging conversation where we touch on many topics, but we get an update on where he's at in his mental health. He talks about relapse and relapse in his own life uh, recently. We talk about stress and the importance of keeping that low and how he manages to do so. Um, and then we go on to the general sort of questions like the biggest epiphany in recovery, biggest roadblock, how he overcame it. Uh, yeah, there's just, so we covered so much, it's hard to really summarize it. But as always, it was a pleasure to talk with Harris. I think he's a good guy with a lot to say. So hopefully uh, you guys enjoy it as much as you did the first one. So without further ado, here is Harris. Welcome back to the show, Harris. Thank you, Stuart. Welcome back yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, yeah, how have you been since we last spoke? Terrible. Yeah? Yeah, but I thought that would be a good opportunity to uh, for your listening viewers to see uh, a guy who's completely fallen off the uh, pedestal of recovery into relapse yeah. in an entertaining way. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I guess, what, why have you relapsed or fallen back do you think well first of all um i actually may be the relapse king actually i I think i may be the i'm I'm gonna get a crown with a little big r on it i think there's a a few things as i look because i've been writing about it uh sort of keeping a daily journal which is actually sort of becoming an interesting little book Hmm. um about what drives it and what happened here and I think there's a number of factors. One, um, you know, I have, a, I have a lot of health anxiety, and, and which drives OCD stuff. Like something's gonna. If I if I talk to a doctor or a friend or something, and and they've done some operation or some disease, I mean, I'm like all over. The, I do the. I'm on the internet checking, and I have that stuff. Hmm. So for the most part, I've been pretty good not doing that for the last year, and it's been good. But then my mother got who's 92 she passed away so that kind of triggered kind of like i always thought that was one of my things that if when my parents passed away it's like that was the reason oh, i hope they don't pass away which drove a lot of ocd uh, stuff yeah. so ironically when she passed away which was the last excuse of like oh i'll just do this one more little thing to make sure she mm-hmm. that ironically was sort of a contradiction because i started to get more anxious and at the same time I was I'm I wrote this movie last about six months ago that got a lot of attention the script and it's now it's this sort of big thing hmm. and so I got signed to a new agency and they're pushing it and I'm the director and now I'm starting to wonder oh God why did I say I'm going to direct it because it's so much pressure yeah and, and but now I'm kind of in it so that's creating anxiety like what if I screw up you know what if it's what if I blow it what if I'm not good enough all that stuff. So I slowly started to, it kind of crept in and I kind of did one little, I'll do one little compulsion just to, and it let me sleep one night and then one turned into two. And before you know it, it was like, it's like, to me, it was like a little train in the distance and you sort of hear it. Yeah. It's coming closer and closer and you look away and, you, and it's a little bit closer. And then before you know it, it's like, whap. <laughs> and then I just became completely paralyzed. I'm laughing about it because it was so you know, this is the thing you train not to do. Yeah. And then suddenly it's like, you're just, you know, I'm doing everything I'm not supposed to be doing. So it's been humbling. It really has. Cause I really, it really threw me for a loop. So I think a lot of those things kind of came into play. Mm. You know? so. Okay. No, fair enough. Um, it's obviously good to hear, hear you busy as well. Um, and obviously sorry to hear about your mom. Thanks man. Appreciate yeah. it. No worries. Um, so yeah, so it does seem like a lot, a lot's coming back into your life right now, which obviously, as you know, and I'm sure listeners know, can be a catalyst for for OCD to come back. Is when there's so many life life pressures and and, and stresses. Um, 
and I'm blanking here. What was my point? Oh, that was it. On the, you just, there was a really, really good analogy or metaphor. I always get the two confused about the train coming back. Uh, and you know, it's, you can hear it in the distance, like you said, and the next thing you know, I kind of, it's like a Prius. I think it, Priuses are everywhere in London now, and you can't hear them when they're on electric mode. And the next thing you know, they're right up alongside you, and then you jump. And anyway, or I do. No, that's a better analogy, actually, because you're right. It's like because you, I could hear the train. Actually, that's better because you can't hear it. And and you think and you, it's like having a drink. You know, I don't drink, but I mean, I can only imagine. It's like you know, I know some people in the certainly this business where they've had problems with alcohol and they go, yeah. oh, I can just have one drink, but they can't. Yeah. Because when they have one, it just, and you, and, and it's, and you, if you think you can do, oh, I can do that one compulsion, it's not going to, and then it just, the whole thing unravels and it's amazing to me that that can happen. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's a, it's a, like you said, it's a slippery slope. Um, and so I guess you, you mentioned there, you, you did that one initial compulsion to obviously get some sleep and, um, were you resisting it for a while before then? Yeah. In fact, I did. I was one of these guys. I stopped all my OCD stuff in almost like 48 hours. I mean, it was amazing. It was one of the, most, the greatest days I've ever had because it was like my mother passed away. And I was relieved, actually, because it was like for, the, for her because she was not she was kind of suffering. OK. And also the mental relief of, you know, that's it. You know, so I just kind of all the information I've been reading about and listening to and kind of uh, intellectualizing. It's like going to medical school, but you're not, you haven't really done the operation yet. Yeah. And so now I went, that's it. So I just, I, I just wholeheartedly switched everything, stopped doing mental compulsions, physical compulsions. And then I tried to even challenge it more. So I tried to put myself in anxiety. So if I had, if I found a compulsion that I went, Oh, I won't. I'll just ignore it. I'd go. No, I'm actually going to do the opposite of it to increase more anxiety. And so for that, you know, for the next few days, it was incredibly liberating because I realized a just how pervasive it was in my life in areas I didn't even think. Yeah. Because you know I've had OCD since I was a little boy. You know I've been and I'm a real clever guy. You know so I can mm -hmm. kind of pretend it's part, like oh no I'm not really doing it when I am. And I realized oh my god I'm doing it when I write. You know, to the point where I would, when I'd be writing screenplays, this really blew me away, is I always would find the right word, you know, a piece of dialogue and stuff, and I'd change the word because I thought the character, this would be better for the character. But in, in reality was, I was putting words that made me uncomfortable. So if I said the word, you know, death, I would change the word death to something else, mm. thinking, saying to myself, oh, that's a better word for the character. But really, it's just an OCD thing. And so I realized, oh, my God. It's in my writing too, mm. and so that was that sh shined a light on how pervasive it was in my life. So I found like I felt this was great, but all, in a way it was almost overwhelming the freedom that this afforded me was stopping everything so quickly. And then it was great for like a week, a couple of weeks, and then when I let that one compulsion in, I remember what it was too. Like you know, I have this, I have this. Uh, I'm, maybe I'm telling you too much, but That's good. Good. I, have this, I, have, I have this standing boxing bag on my deck and I work out on it and stuff. And it's really nice. And, been, and I have these three rock stones that are like by my door and they shouldn't really be there, but I just feel, you know, it's an OCD thing. So I remember I took, I took the rocks away. Like I separated them. I put one somewhere else. And that was like, for me, a big deal. Hmm. And then after a few days, it was like, now that be, the new place became, the new OCD ritual, like I was got to be there. And I remember that's when it started, I was, you know, exercising, hitting this bag. And I remember looking over that rock, I said, I'm going to put it back to where it was. And that felt wrong to me. Like I said, oh no. I, and, and so then I just kind of kept it where it was. And that little crack of, you know, just going, oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to upset the apple cart. Yeah. That, that started everything. And then by that night I was, you know, doing all kinds of things. And then within a very short period of time, like hours, I was back in almost full blown, mm. you know, mostly mental things, but it, it, it was so humbling. I got to tell yeah. you, I was just good Lord. Yeah. I mean, that's a good, uh, I guess a good learning for everyone, how 
yeah, like you said, I mean, it's not always going to be the case where one thing kind of trips you up. So I don't want people getting anxious about that, but it can be. Um, and was all of this, did all of this happen? It was after your mum passed away. Is that correct? Yeah. And I should say, because that's a good point you just made for the people that are listening. You have to understand it's very, it's very specific to who you are. Like I am very, I'm always been an all or nothing guy. Mm. So, you know, I go to extremes when it comes to exercise, when it comes to writing, you know, I don't just write five hours a day. I write 12 hours a day until it's done. Uh, you know, I don't work out an hour and a half a day. I work out three hours a day, you know, so I do things. I'm that guy who does things. I'm not, I'm that's, I think a little bit out of the norm. Mm. So, you know, I just, which is also problematic, but yeah, it happened after my mom, my mother passed away, which brought up a lot of uh, mortality, finality things, which then fed into my worst, one of my biggest core you know, OCD beliefs, which is, you know, my, one is resources and one is health. Those yes. two things. Those are my, you know, and that's another thing I learned from listening to you over the last couple of years, which is you got to know those core beliefs because everything stems from, the, I used to think I had well, all these billions. No, it's always comes down to two, to two things, you know, survival and then also health stuff. Yeah. And so when I, if I can go that back to that core, those two core things, I go, oh, there it is again. And I have to ignore those two things, and then that affects the tentacles of the, you know, expanding into the all the you know things that become overwhelming. So yeah, now that's really interesting. And this is because I, I ran um, the OCD camp recently here in the UK, and something Pete, the therapist, brought up was uh, I'm, I'm probably going to butcher this, but it was something like our obsessions or our, our fears are in complete contradiction to our values or a complete opposition. So for example, like when I think about all the themes I've had in OCD, they, they're all completely opposite to my number one value, which is freedom. Right. I, I don't mean freedom in the, in the sense of a, you know, you Americans throw around, but <laughs> freedom in the sense of like uh, freedom to do what I want with my time, my creativity, my, you know, um, that those types of, those types of freedoms. Um, and and all of my themes meant me losing my freedom in that sense. You know, whether it was ultimately worrying about I'm a bad person ending up in prison, losing my freedom that way, uh, getting some disease, which means no one will ever love me or want to be around me. That kind of steals my freedom in that sense. Um, and there was a couple other values that completely contradicted. And I thought that was interesting. Uh, you know, what? I think you just nailed some. That's very true. Is that the thing that you're most afraid of, the OCD stuff, is, is always counter to that. Mm. And it's, it's, it's stopping you from the very thing that you desire in your vet. Like, I want security, emotional and physical security, that I, I, because I didn't get it as a kid. Mm. So I strive that now. So everything I do is about, you know, looking for that certainty, as Mark Freeman would say, that you yeah. can never find um, in those two areas, which is you know, emotional and physical security. But in looking for that, I create insecurity by doing all my OCD, by the nature of doing that. So it, it's, it's completely dismantling the very thing. So I never get security because I'm looking for it all the time. Yeah. And I can't get it. And But if I let it go, that's in a weird way security because I'm no longer looking for it. And I go, well, listen, if you, you know, and ironically, I remember going into, I just got signed to this big agency here in the United States. Mm. There's was, was three big ones. And I've been trying to get with these guys for a number of years. And they only really, they only take you if, you know, you know, I don't love these guys. They're intimidating. But anyway, after this project I did, they called me in. And I remember going in and normally I would go in and sell myself and go, oh, you know, but instead I just went in and I said, listen, if I can make you guys some money, great. If you want, if you can do something with this, terrific. If not, don't worry about it. And by not looking for the security in them, yeah. ironically, that became way more attractive for them because they were like, God, that's so refreshing. <laughs> but I only got to that point because I've been doing this so long and I realized the other way, trying to get security with them, like to go, so you're going to represent me on this and you, do you think I'm great? Do you really think I'm talented? And, you know, I want, I want a love fest for them yeah. to go. And I realized, that doesn't exist anymore. It's just it's business. They probably see I, I can I can make them some money. 
maybe this maybe this guy will be our next a-list director guy or something let's take a shot and i go okay let's give it a shot if it doesn't that ironically made me feel more secure because i wasn't looking for it so just giving that specific that was like a real eye opener for me because you know but it took me 20 years to sort of get to that point and uh yeah, no, I mean, obviously, it's great that that worked for you, and I think that's a good point. Like you said, there's there really is no certainty, there's no security, there's, there's none of it. Um, and OCD tries to get people to find that security, to find that certainty. But the more you do, or the more you play OCD's game, the less likely you ever are to find any certainty or security. And sometimes you're not necessarily going to find it by kind of letting let, letting go and going with the flow and accepting uncertainty but you're more likely to find it that way than you are playing ocd's game but OCD, yeah but yeah but then, so i was playing a game with myself this morning which was i was like you don't need to go to a doctor to get this check you're, you're just leave it alone but then i go boy those are the people that get nailed because they don't go to a doctor so i go actually the ocd is helpful because i'm it's my due diligence is really good so then you play that it's about degree too. Mm. So the common sense would go, listen, you get checked once a year or whatever, and if you're okay, you, and then, but it's it, it, if you go like, well, I'm going to go every month, then it's it's out of balance. So I think there's a balance thing too, because again, with the all or nothing thing, I go, well, then I'm never going to get checked out, and, and then I go, well, that's not good either. Yeah. Because because people, people if they neglect themselves something can happen there. So that's another game of OC, which I'm seeing in me just specifically, which is there has to be a common sense balance element yeah. so that I have to go, look, you know, what's the most, what's the logical thing here to do and then leave it there. So. Yeah. I, I think that's a, yeah, that's a really good point because I, I don't want to say people need to find what normal is because sometimes normal is messed up. Uh, for example, like you said, people, so, you know, normal might be that people don't go get health checkups, you know, ever. And that's probably not a good thing. So, but it's kind of, like you said, a common sense thing. Well, what's a best practice? A best practice is maybe, like you said, once a year is what the doctors advise. Um, so that's probably what I should follow. And it's the same as say contamination, washing your hands. Um, normal is probably people wash their hands for like five seconds which frankly isn't really good enough so uh, a good a good benchmark could be actually with soap for 20 seconds is probably far enough so that then becomes your your goal of where to get to yeah. um, sometimes normal is where it should be but not always yeah yeah like it's finding that that's what i've the big thing for me is i have to go it's good enough like what's the balance yeah like, like the hand washing you go let's sing happy birthday for 20 seconds and wash your hand and i go okay <laughs> That's what they, that's what the general rule, I'll do that. Brush your teeth for two minutes. Okay. Don't have to do it for 10 minutes. Don't have to do it for 30 seconds. Do it for two and then move on. Yeah. And so I, I, that's what I try to do is find kind of the tenants. To, but boy, is it a slog, man. I mean, it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's, it's almost like, I, jo- I have to joke about it because it's just like, you know, I tell people, whenever I go to a new doctor, like, I always go, picture Woody Allen times 20. And that's me. So they right away they go, oh God, do I want to, do I want to work with this guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think we discussed that in the, in the the first chat we had uh, with yeah. Seth, Seth Green. Yeah, Seth without a paddle. Is it Seth? Yeah. Green? Right. And and you writing yourself in, into that character. Yeah. Um, okay, so because I remember there was a couple things. Like obviously depersonalization as a symptom of OCD, and yeah. the other one was the kind of the, this fear of death of obsessing around death, and yeah. you said a lot of it attached onto your your parents. Yeah. Um, so then, do do you think uh, when obviously when your mum passed away, I don't want to keep bringing it up. I feel bad. Okay. So, but it, it, um, yeah. that kind of in a way was kind of appeased your your mind and your worries and then then it felt like it went away for a week but then OCD was like okay now I'm going to latch on to something else yeah 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 I, I think that it you know those were the primary things because it was so um it was so real in my life in other words it was a real thing it wasn't just like thinking oh am I gonna what 
what would happen? I mean, it's that, you know, someone's actually ill and you see their, their progression going down. You go, my God, this is real. So you're focusing on the reality of it. Yeah. Like if you had a cut hand, you're going, well, let me deal with the cut hand and I can go on. Through the... And then when that left me, now, now the OCD part goes into, well, let's make up some other stuff now. Hmm. And you think, I, and, and that's what keeps fooling me is I think I thought that would end it. And I did the same thing like 10 years earlier when my father passed away. I was like for a week, same exact thing. I was like, felt like a hundred pounds off my shoulders. And then I started it back again. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, it's a tricky little thing. Yeah. It kind of, um, it, it shows you that we shouldn't chase the, the theme. If that makes sense, we should chase the OCD because it's, it's like a, a, I always say it's like a monster that just keeps changing its mask. And, you know, and the mask is contamination today, tomorrow it's relationships, the next day it's religion or the fear of death or depersonalization. Um, and if we keep tackling those different masks, all we're ever doing is getting rid of the mask, but OCD has a hundred more. Um, and we need to be tackling the gremlin behind the mask. That's been like the single biggest and refreshing thing that I've learned and trying to do now, which is when it comes from anything, whether it comes from, I realize I can go from one thing to another and go from health to business to, you know, regret mm. to, you know, it is every kind of thing you can think of. And I go, Oh, it's all the same. It's just one big, huge umbrella of OCD. So now I have to go, Oh, that's OCD. I say now that's OCD as opposed to, Oh, that's my, death worry that's my business worry that's yeah. my and by doing that it takes away all that the further analyzation of each one separately i just go oh that's ocd you just gotta it's your ocd guy knocking on the door you know hey yeah. <laughs> hello. you go hey, i want to have some coffee you talk to you and you go uh stay in the backyard well yeah <laughs> if, 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 i can't you can't come in right now and that's all i have to do yeah that's it and if i can train myself to keep sending that don't let them inside the house or if he does get inside the house or she gets inside the house and sits down at the kitchen table, I go, okay, well, you can sit at the kitchen table and I'm going to be, I'm going to do something else. That is the, if I can just focus on that, that's the easiest thing to kind of, I can grasp that, you yeah. know? Okay. So. so is that kind of what we were talking about before we started recording where learning to kind of like let the thoughts go and is it that type of stuff when it starts knocking? Yeah, and even letting the thoughts go is not because I, I can't even do that because it's the it's the old pink elephant thing, you know. Yeah. I I just have to go. Uh, I kind of go there. It is. It's cr creating a lot of distress. Um, okay, just don't go do something else right now. So I either distract myself or I go just feel the anxiety, but don't engage in. Don't look up anything. Don't go on the internet. Don't look at past emails. Don't do anything yeah. to address the anxiety with that feeling. And then if I really feel compelled, then I go, okay, go. If I have to, I'll get up and go, uh, uh, go do some uh, stretching. Go, go, go work out. Go something to stop me from. Otherwise, Doing you know, if I'm. Compulsion. Yeah, then I'm yeah. dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm dead. Yeah, no, no. Thanks for that. Yeah, good way of looking at it. Um, and you mentioned before uh, about you, what you mentioned, uh, sorry, I'm muttering, about um, stopping medication. Yeah. Uh, at what time frame did you stop the medication? Well, I did it. I, I tapered off very slowly. Okay. okay. I was on two things. You know, I've, I've been on very low, like a low dose of SSRI. Yeah. Which I found it didn't really help very much, but what it did is stops the bottom from going. It just gives you a little bit of a cushion so that you don't go down the for me anyway, that yeah. spiral. And I didn't like some of the side effects. Um so I and I thought, okay, so I went off that. And the other one I was actually using for anxiety for a long time was a little bit of clonopin at night. But what I so I I went off them very, very, very slowly. Like you know, I'm talking like, you know, like Every five days, I go a little bit down. So I did all the right tapering, but it was still hard because you, because you do get physically dependent. But what I found was it really is a band aid approach. Like in other words, especially with the clonopin, yeah, it can help with the anxiety. 
Yeah. But when you get rid of it, it's there again. So now you don't have the crutch of the, so you're, st I'm starting from scratch in a way. Um, uh, so, but on the other hand, the SSRI, I mean, if there's, is a depressive component to the OCD, um, I mean, there is something to be said for stopping that bottom from dropping out too. Hmm. So, you know, but I'm kind of hell bent on, I'm going, I'm in this state, I'm going, I can do this. I can do this with my, with the, you know, ERP. I can do this with, I can, I've got a, it's like a physical training thing. I really look at it like yeah. working out and I go, well, you know, it took me six months to my, for my flexibility to increase, but I had to do it every day, twice a day. So why should I not expect that to happen mentally? I mean, I have to work out twice a day or 10 times a day until, yeah. so why, you know, so I'm trying to sort of see a comparison and do it that way. Yeah. I mean, that's a healthy way of looking at it. The, the brain is kind of this organ that needs to be stretched. It needs to be moved. It needs to be worked. Um, same as kind of, it's maybe over oversimplified, but doing a crossword, you know, I'm terrible now, but I know that if I did one every day, I would probably become very good at them over time or Sudoku or whatever it is. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, so you mentioned there about stretching and I remember on the first podcast, you were talking about how exercise and healthy eating has, has helped you yeah. with just mental well being. I guess, how's that going? And has there been anything else? Yeah, I mean, I've really, I've even curtailed my diet. Even I mean, I've like the the an incredibly clean diet now, and and it's it's important to me because it makes me feel, it balances me out. So you know, and it makes and it psychologically makes me feel like uh, it just centers me. You know, so I think nutrition is really important. You know, um, exercise is really important for me because it does bleed off the anxiety that's associated with. OCD. And I see my friends around me, by the way, who don't exercise and don't particularly eat well, and they're in the same business I am, and, and they're suffering from anxiety and depression, and I see it's happening to them. But they um, they may not have OCD. Some may, they haven't talked about it, but I see the effect that it has on them just being the average person. Yeah. And so I need those two things to keep me going and to keep me centered, or I'm just, a, you know, forget it. Yeah, so I think they're they're underestimated too. By the way, I mean it makes sense. I mean, you, you, your body has to affect your mind, vice versa, somehow. Yeah. So if you if you're eating you know a lot of sugar or certain fats or processed foods and stuff like that, it, it does have a immediate effect. You know, now they're finding even more correlation with your what you're eating, your stomach bacteria, and your mental state. And you know, so I think there's a practical, a really very practical thing there. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think it's a it's a bi um, evolutionary thing or, or biological thing because uh, you know I mean you're a script writer, obviously among among other things. I work in an office predominantly, or even even now working with young people uh, doing sort of therapy. I'm sitting on my ass for sort of eight hours a day, uh, and you know you said there you write scripts for like twelve hours a day, so you're sitting on yours for twelve. And I think, you know, 2,000 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, we probably would have been in wars, fighting battles, kind of foot soldiers. 3,000 years ago, we would have been running through woods or jungles or whatever. Like, we would have been moving all day because we had to, to get our food or fight our battles or whatever it was just to survive. And yeah. I think that's wired into the body. And now a lot of us just don't move enough. And that's it, I mean, obviously, I, I don't know if there's any research for this, but to me, it just feels like common sense that that would affect our brains if we're not, not acting. Not only that, but, but I think there is, you know, I have a really good friend who's a, um, he's a, 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 a physicist, a health physicist. So he goes around and hospitals hire him to, you know, uh, you know, uh, make sure that their, their radiation equipment is, is calibrated and. But the way that physicists are trained is that they go to the, unlike doctors, they have to go to the core of, like, how does this actually work on a cellular level, what, at the very base of what we know? And when it comes to exercise, it's almost like the cells, when they're stimulated physically, there is an ap absolutely cause-effect situation where it's almost like cleaning out the system. It's like a Bunsen burner, you know, that's under a, you know, like a beaker that would, you know, and when the Bunsen burner, which is like basically the exercise part, it bubbles and everything, and it sort of sterilizes the whole thing. Yeah. 
but if you never turn on the Bunsen burner, everything just sits and coagulates. And I know that sounds simplistic, but if you actually talk on a like molecular level mm. to these guys, who that's all they do is study cells and DNA and stuff. Movement, you know, and exercise, it stimulates the body. And so that if you, so you have to think, well, if you have mental challenges and whether depression or anxiety or OCD or all three, there's got to be some connection with, and the same thing with what you're putting inside your system. I mean, it, you'd have to be, it just seems insane that there's no connection, which is how most people live. So they eat what they want, they don't exercise, and yeah. they go, why do I feel lousy? So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, humans are, are very organic uh, machines, and there are a million things make up the human. So, you know, there's many factors. If they're not exercising, not eating healthy, the job's not going well, they've got a terrible home life, et cetera, et cetera. It's inevitable that that human's probably going to get depressed. It's they would be think, superhuman not to. If I didn't exercise every day and eat the way that I do, I think I'd absolutely have to be on medication. Hmm. Because, I, because in other words, I wouldn't have anything to bleed off the anxious natural anxious state i'm just when i say anxious state what i mean is i'm i'm, I'm i've always been a sensitive guy so i'm hypersensitive to yeah. so i i understand that so when somebody is in a group of people and they just kind of let things roll off their back well i'm observing and i'm analyzing and judging and all that stuff and so when i tire myself out a little bit it it dampens that feeling and that's and I go that I know there's a cause effect there. So for me personally, I go if I didn't do that, well, I have to do something. I'm going to be so anxious, I'm going to have to pop a pill or something. So yeah. I go yeah. well, I'll put in the discipline of exercising every day, so I won't have to take that extra measure to just to feel quote more normal. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, and I think because um, I, I also don't want to have the two two side by side. I feel medication goes hand in hand with healthy eating exercise etc um so for those that want to do both that's awesome um but they should never be seen as one or the other and i think sometimes people can look at medication and think i I just do that i don't want to do anything else and it's like no, take the medication absolutely if you want uh but build in these other things because one day you may want to come off the medication and when you do you want these other supports there so that it's not like the medication was the only thing helping if you've got medication yeah. was one of 10 things and it might just be degree too like you know i may go back on a little medication but it, by yeah. doing these other things i might not have to go on as much okay so so let's say because it's all like i look at everything as a tool hmm. so if i'm you know again you know if i had to take the doctor's going you know oh here take 40 milligrams of this because well, if I do these other things, maybe I can get by with 20 or 15. And so there's less side effects. I get some benefit from there, but the other one's kind of, so it's all kind of working together. I go, how can I balance, you know, just like by the same token, if I don't take any medication, well, then I'm going to have to really exhaust myself on aerobics. And I go, well, I don't want to work that hard. So I go, maybe there's a, maybe I can kind of be in the middle there. And I think as I'm getting older, I'm starting to realize there's nothing wrong with being in the middle. Yeah. You know, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good way of looking at it. Um, and I also feel medication for some people doesn't work. Um, the, the, the research shows that. People have talked to me about it. Um, and if you're one of those people, sadly, where the SSRIs don't seem to, to make a difference, then then it's important to look at these other things like nutrition, exercise, uh, meditation, better sleep, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm trying, you're trying to stack the deck in your favor. You Absolutely. Know? So that's a good point. I mean, medication, did it work for me? I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I mean, I have some friends who are on stuff and it's, they'll swear it just changed their whole lives. And I go, awesome. wow, they're lucky. Yeah. I wish I could be one of those people, but I never found anything where I went, oh my God, it's like the lift of, you know, it was all kind of like, well, maybe it's cutting into it a little bit, but nothing profound. No. So. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, because... They, they, they still don't know i did an episode of medication recently really good episode hopefully it's helped a lot of people but um they they still don't know really why uh, ssris work for ocd specifically even in depression the whole chemical imbalance is still just a theory it's never been proven um and i have no doubt there's a biological element behind all mental health conditions but 
I think some people can sometimes just hold on to that and forget all these other aspects of the people that are around you, the things you're putting into your body. It all makes up the individual. Um, and you, you could you could have the biological side that's working fine, but everything else is shitty around you and that's going to make you down. Or maybe everything's good around you, but the biological side's not quite right at the minute. Um, it's, it's not always like one or the other. Yeah, you know, people ask me something, you know, I teach, you know, once a week at UCLA, a writing program, you know, mm. and uh, film class. And I get all these young kids from around the world and they all want to go into showbiz and be writers. And they always go, how, what's, how do you write a great script, you know, and they're all writing. And, and a lot of them buy these courses and they, they listen to the guy who goes, here are the 10 rules to write a successful. And, I, and like medication and anxiety and what we're talking about, I go, there is no one way. There is it's it's a combination of inspiration and experience and time and work and these all these little things that sort of come together that you kind of feel, you go okay and you kind of do it yeah and it comes out of all that that's the only time anything good happens but people don't want to do that because it's there's so uncertain because they have to rely on inspiration and they have to rely on work mm-hmm. and they want to go, tell me the eight ways the, the the rules that if I follow this map at the end of it, it's going to be, and no matter what I say, they buy the books, they go to the lectures, and they listen to these guys who really haven't written anything in their lives. They just look back on something. Like they look at a film that's already made, and they go, oh, here's what's going on in this film. But anyone can look back and go, here's how I'm assuming they wrote it or created it. Yeah. But any any movie or TV show that's ever happened – People are just, you know, there. It's a collaborative thing of a million things coming together, and you pray, and you go. I hope if these are good people and everyone's got good ideas, something is going to happen. But you don't know. Mm-hmm. So in a way, you kind of. That's the same thing to me as working on your OCD or depression or anxiety, which is you take anything you can get and you kind of put them all together in this big ball of, you know, recovery thing, and you go, okay, well, you know, come on, God. <laughs> faith or whatever you know make it work yeah but you know no one's gonna go here if you do these eight things you know yeah absolutely yeah that's a really good point yeah you're you're putting things together as long as they're legal uh to to kind of help improve your your mental health uh, and it's a matter of testing implementing things changing things you know uh, all the different tools and interventions and just finding what works for you as an individual human being because it's going to be different person to person. Um, so earlier you mentioned about obviously being a director now, um, yep. and you mentioned about your own anxieties that's brought up. Have you, because obviously I don't know too much around being a director, but I'm guessing you have to kind of control the set, uh, you know, to creatively get the output you want. It, are there a lot of emotions on set, including anxiety? And if so, how do you kind of work with your staff to not let that overcome them? Yeah, well, what it is is like, you know, when you when I, I feel most comfortable writing, okay, because I've done it the longest. Yeah. And when I write, when I finish writing something, you really you really have directed it in your head. Like in other words, because all you're doing is you're putting what you see in your head onto the paper. So that people can then read that script or that document and go, oh, let's turn this into what was in his head. And here's the document that we can do it. So then people come on board, the set designer and the cinematographer and all these people. And you, what I'm trying to do is go, you guys are really talented at what you do, but this is what the overall should look like. And here's the script to sort of show it, prove it. But the biggest anxiety producing thing is you say to yourself, what if what if in the end I'm not that good? Like what if I screw up or maybe my that vision of what it is is not good enough or or um so you're constantly wondering that's the big thing is you're doubting, you know, you know, like why am I even doing this? Because it's a lot of pressure to just, you have to hire people and people have their own opinions and then you know it's a lot of money that so people are worried about. So it, everything's a war or a challenge or every every day's a I mean, from anything like, you know, even casting the thing. I mean, they go, can it be a woman, even though it's a guy? You know, can it be, uh, could it be someone from another country? Could we do like, anything and everything? Everyone's trying to, t- to go, how can we hedge our bet here? 
And then you start to doubt yourself because you go, well, how do, what do I know? I just wrote this. So that's the anxieties you think, what if I'm wrong? Yeah. But they could be just equally wrong because the thing about making movies or anything is nobody really knows. You know, that's why when movies come out on a Friday, you know, everyone who's involved in that movie thinks it's going to be a hit by Saturday night. And then if it doesn't make money, they go, what happened? Because there's no way you can judge. You don't know. You just people go to things for the weirdest. You know, I had a movie open two weeks ago nationally, theatrically. So it went all, all over the place. And everyone was going, the distributor went, this is going to be great. It's got a great cast. You know, and it comes out the next day. It got the worst reviews. It's just like this. And I was like, I don't, what happened? And suddenly and I went, oh my God, who am I to direct this big thing? I can't even direct this small little movie that just got. So, and I, I thought people were going to really love, I mean, some people liked it, but for the most part, people were kind of, didn't respond the way that I, I thought. Yeah. And I can't really, I don't know why, maybe it could be a, a mixture of a million things, but you just, you don't know why you like something and why you don't like something. So directing to me is like, well, then why even do it? Just write it and then sell it and <laughs> never look at it again. Yeah. Like if somebody wants to do that. Like I go, why did I ever say I want to direct this movie? Because now I have to go to meetings and I have to like convince people that I know what I'm doing. And, you know, and then, you know, I'll meet a cinematographer and he'll go, why should this guy direct? You know, I, I know everything about cameras. I should be directing. And then I have to convince him that I know what I'm doing. And the actors have to feel comfortable. And, you know, the, the actors want to work with a huge A-list director. Yeah. You know, they're, why am I working with this kid when I could work with Martin Scorsese? You know, and you go, yeah, why should he be working with me? You know, and, and start doing all this. That's where the you start to get, you know. Yeah. So, uh, but I guess I have a big enough ego where I go, well, I'm going to give it a shot anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's probably the best approach. And was that film that just came out, was it, uh, is it Alex and the List? Yeah, although I, I wouldn't, don't recommend your, anyone <laughs> watching now because after reading the, re, re, I think it's a nice, gentle little movie because it's a very sweet little movie, which is what it was meant to be. Yeah. But uh, boy, people just hate it. Well, critics don't often know what they're talking about. Most of the, the films I love have done terrible uh, on IMDb and stuff like that. So, yeah. yeah. Especially, like I mean, I'm a big Will Ferrell fan and every film he's ever made has been destroyed by critics or IMDb. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But it hurts. It hurts when they, you know, you, oh, yeah. you know the first review said, you know, another, another Harris Goldberg film. This one is as absolutely as unromantic and unfunny as humanly possible. I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> like someone just like took my head off. Yeah. And I go, oh, it doesn't bother me. But it does. I it feel does, like it's, yeah. I asked a girl out on Friday and she said, I don't think so, pal. <laughs> the ugly as that. Goodbye. Yeah. Have you ever heard of the man in the arena quote? No, what's that? Um, is it Roosevelt? maybe Rosa or Benjamin Franklin or one of the U S presidents, um, basically said, uh, it's not the critic who counts. It's the man in the arena whose face is bloody and sweaty, etc." Um, anyway, it's a, it's a really long quote. I recommend you, you, uh, read it and just read it whenever, um, why is she passed? My wife's passed me something. Oh, sorry. She's passed me the quote. Hey, shall I read it out? Sure. Um, seeing as I've gone too far now, uh, it says the, the it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errors, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end of triumph of high achievement, and who at the end... Uh, worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be of those cold and timid souls who neither knew victory nor defeat. Uh, it's Theodore Roosevelt. Um, oh, and I just dropped the book. Uh, that's that's pretty amazing. Although I'd rather have the critic go, "Hey, he's great." Oh yeah, yeah. That quote was way longer than I remembered. So sorry about that. But, um, but yeah, no, I love that quote because. Uh, 
it reminds me to 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 be okay to to fail to learn to yeah. and like you said if some people like it like good enough but i know what you mean i there's still every part of me that wants to be loved by everyone and yeah, everything I, mean, I, I do be gold yeah but that's for me personally like regret and not measuring up is a huge thing for me. And, and that's, I have to fight that constantly just yeah. to be just like, you know what, it's good enough because I, I don't feel I ever am. Yeah. You know, and so, uh, you know, uh, but in the end, you know, I also see, you know, I do this thing, which is all OCD thing is once a week I go on uh, recent notable deaths, you know, on the internet, and, it, and it says Newsweek who died, and you see these people, you know, famous people, scientists, you yeah. know, actors, or, politicians whatever you know so and so passed away at 92 86 or whatever and they've done these amazing things and then when they pass away it's like okay next yeah. so you go even even the achievements people make you know you live you do your best you can you pass away and then no one really cares that much yeah so in the end you go well does it really matter that i'm i mean do i need to push myself to the point where i have to make this huge mark when in the end you know, it's a big deal. You come up with a movie someone likes or, you know, in the end, it, it really doesn't matter that much. It's more like, how did you live? Did you enjoy the people in your life? Did you enjoy Like I look at you, Stu, and you know, I go, oh, he's got a wife who just handed him a helping do the podcast. I'd love to have that. Like, that's an amazing thing to me. Like, I'd love to have that. Somebody in my, who has my back like that. And I go, that, that to me is even, I'd rather have that than a script that everybody likes. Because I think that's more in the long run. I go, oh, you have to, 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 if I got the end of my life and I had someone in my, you know, who had my back like that, that to me right now at my age is more important than, you know, doing some mass entertainment that, you know, will be forgotten anyway. Hmm. So it's a weird thinking change, but it really is, is, you know, I look for like family things now, small moments, you know, having coffee with someone that I really enjoy. Yeah. Just little, little, Little things like playing chess with friends of mine. I just like those couple hours. And so that's a big, like, philosophical life change, which has helped OCD a lot because I'm not going after the impossible. Yeah. So I know I'm blabbing here. So no, no, no. It was, it was interesting. I just wanted to let you finish. I didn't want to interrupt. Um, I think that's a great way of looking at life. I feel, yet like, same as you, I have these aspirations. I have goals. But ultimately, I know what's important when I don't get caught up in those goals is that it's it's am I enjoying, for example, if I've got a goal for the podcast to hit maybe a million downloads. Um, yes, that's great. But what's important is am I enjoying the process of doing the the interviews, of, of releasing them? And as long as that's yes, then I'm already a massive success. It doesn't matter if anyone likes it. If I'm enjoying the process, that's the key point in life. The other thing is, like you said, you know, things I've realized as well is, yeah, going for coffee with people, with good friends, people you enjoy conversations with, spending time in nature, uh, playing basketball like I did the other day. It's been about six to eight months since I last touched a ball and I used to play daily. So doing those things, that's what's meaningful to me and that's living. And the more I can do that and get in that frame of mind, the happier I am or the more content. Um, but I think, like you say, it's too easy. I know I found myself recently getting caught up in those trying to achieve those big things. And then then you're kind of stuck on the success of it. If it does well, great. If it doesn't, now everything's been put on that instead of enjoying the process. And, you know, it's actually it's one of those contradiction things. Like with your podcast, you go, of course, you want to go, I want this to be, you know, 10 million people and everyone because it's a natural thing. Yeah. But the way to get there is you go, you know, like, why, why, how, you know, how did I meet you? Why do I want, listen to your podcast? Because they're really well done. There, there's a, something about them where you go, I enjoy listening to those. So then you send it to somebody, hey, take a look at this. And then somebody else listens to it and they become a fan because it's good. And by that nature of something being something you're passionate about and you do, it naturally starts to move up the business chain where, you know, people just want to, like, good stuff rises to the top eventually. I mean, there are things you can do. Yeah, you can market things and you can make people more aware. But if it's not good, then it's going to fade away. No one's ever going to hear about it again anyway. Yeah. So the thing that you ultimately want, which is at times where you go, I want this to be, you know, I want a million people to love this. Well, if you weren't doing what you're doing on a daily basis and you were enjoying it, 
and it was good, you'd never get there anyway. Yeah. So it's a weird thing. So it's like the desire, of the, the final desire of what, like, it's like if I want to hit movie, just saying I want to hit movie is a sure way not to have a hit movie. Yeah. I have to go, do I like the story? Do I believe in it? And I go, yeah, I love this character. I love this story. And then I just do it. And I go, well, if I like it, I'm assuming other people are going to like it. And usually if it's good, it's the weirdest thing. People just sort of come on board and they, cause they go, this is good. And there's very few things that are good and passionate and all this. Stuff. And it starts to rise up. And before you know it, it turns into a movie and then it's out there. And if people like it, then it becomes successful. But it's only because you believe in the original thing. Otherwise, you know, any, anytime I've ever been hired to write something or do a movie, because they go, we think this is going to make a lot of money. Bomb. It's a complete disaster. And I think mo for the most part, other people have had that experience. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know. No, so, yeah, I think that's a good way of looking at it. And, uh, yeah, it is kind of uh, paradoxical. But, yeah, the, the more you try, sometimes that's the worse it gets. And just kind of, you know, I like to, quote, unquote, go with the flow. And the more I do that in life, the the more, more enjoyment I have, the more success I have in whatever capacity that is, the more I cling to something, often the less I have. So I guess it's kind of like trying to hold water in your hand. If you close your fist to clench it, it's going to spill all through your hands. If you yeah. keep a loose grip, you're going to be able to hold more of it. Um, yeah, but it's damn hard. Oh, yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem. Is, oh, yeah. God, is it hard? Yeah. It's so hard. Yeah, I make mistakes all the time with it, but it's a learning, right? And that's the, it's a journey and yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know how else you get it. You just, it's just, it's just, it's like we're all so flawed, you know, and, and there's, just, you just kind of go, if I say that to myself, I go, well, human beings are just flawed and yeah. you just can't, you just, you're just bombarded with things every day and stresses and you go, you just do the best you can. That's a relief to me because, it, because I go, I can't, Otherwise, I'd just live in regret. And I go, why didn't I do that? I should have known better. I should have, mm. you know, I, all the information was there. How could I have missed that? But then I go, wait a minute. You think of all the people that are in amazing positions as of, of politicians or doctors or whatever, and they make mistakes. And you go, how can they make mistakes? They're, they're so well trained and experienced. But everyone, you cannot not do it because you're a human being. So you go, well, that's just our nature. Yeah. And then I kind of, I, I try to convince myself, you know, not to be too hard on myself. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's a common mistake a lot of people make. Um, I mean, it took me two years of therapy to be able to pretty much say I'm proud of myself. And not just, not, it's not like I couldn't say I wasn't proud of myself before. It was whenever I said it, there was hesitation in my voice there was a caveat coming straight after those words left my mouth. And now I'm at a point where I can say it and there's, there's no hesitation in my voice. There's no caveats and I truly mean it, but it took two years of working with a therapist. Uh, this was a non OCD therapist cause I wasn't working on OCD with her. Um, just the other stuff in my life, just to break down those barriers <laughs> to, to get rid of all those limiting beliefs, but it's taken that long. Yeah, because you didn't believe it. I, I was talking about you in my film class, actually, because people were going, oh, it's too hard. And I said, look at this guy. And I showed him the very first podcast you ever did. Yeah. And you just started and you were a little, you know, you were good, but you're a bit awkward. And you're like, you're, you're figuring out how do I do this? Yeah. You know, the sound and all that stuff. And then I go, now here's X amount of years later. And he's, you've got like, you know, hundreds of these hmm. things. I go, look, the guy's got like, he, it's a movement now. And it's a, it's a thing. I go, just that. The, the just having done that started something from absolutely zero on an odd subject and that and to start from to having no no one give you any direction and then now it's this like regular thing that that you go oh an ocd story and then you've got this and this and this and you're like a regular fixture mm. i go that is like amazing even if no one ever saw it again it's an amazing thing because it's there and you, no one can take that this bulk of I mean, you know, all these people that you've interviewed and all this information, it's like one-stop shopping. You've created the Walmart of OCD, you know? Yeah. And like, to, you can't deny that. So even, even therapy or no therapy, if you look at that from an outside point of view, you go, wow, that's impressive. Just like I say to myself, I may not be as, I may not have 
you know, the biggest movies in the world. But I go, look, I I came here with nothing to, from L.A., from Canada to L.A. And I've turned, you know, I've made a living as a writer. And I have so many produced movies. And I go, God, that's something. I said, you know, very few people actually do that actually would do it, would even go to that the physical stage of doing it. And I go, but maybe that's good enough. I, you know, I'm not going to be the 1% of, I'm not going to be Martin Scorsese or Clint Eastwood or these guys, but those are rarefied. A lot of that's just luck. Just like with your, with your podcast. I mean, if suddenly somebody saw your podcast, who's the head of Comcast who owns NBC on and they have OCD and they go, we're going to turn this guy into a national figure, you know, and then suddenly you're now you're, you're an Oprah Winfrey and you're like, you know, that could happen, but that's a lucky kind of thing. But in the meantime, you put the, everything in place that if, if that was going to happen, it can happen. Yeah. So that's huge. Yeah. No, thanks, man. I appreciate it. And, uh, I agree with your, your thinking about yourself. Um, I guess it's the hardest thing is, and why it took me so long is, you know, you, we all have those people in our lives and we're obviously examples of them where, you know, they could be the most talented, they could be unbelievably intelligent, kind, whatever it is. And you tell them that everyone else tells them that. And they're still like, no, 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 I'm not, or whatever it is. And it's like, are you, are you insane? Like, why can't you see this? Uh, and it's, it's the same, I guess for me, it's no matter how many downloads I got, no matter how many guests I got on, um, it was never enough. And and I got to the point now where I'm like, you know, it is enough. I'm I'm very proud of myself. Um, yeah. But that's like that, that's sort of the core thing because it was like where however you were brought up. Yeah. Like I know with you know like whatever your whatever however you were brought up in those initial years that made you think I'm not good enough or whatever it is. Yeah. You're look you're always looking to scratch that itch. Yeah. Now starting to after all this work and the stuff to start to go, oh maybe I am, but it's taken a hell of a lot of work. In the yeah. same way that I'm always looking for family and love and where do I go? What's where do I belong? But I go, that's that's not gonna change unless I actually get to that tipping point of like you know Oh, I go, yes, I think I'm, I'm, I think I'm there, but I have to accept the fact that that's always going to be a driving thing with me because it's part of me. Yeah. Because how do you go against, it's like a little puppy that's been flinching because it's been treated poorly. Boy, it takes a long time for that puppy, if it ever, to get completely over that trauma of like, geez, you know. Mm. So, I mean, I'm just talking out of my behind here, but I, from hearing all this stuff over the years, I think some of it may actually be accurate. Yeah. No, I completely agree. And uh, uh, psycho uh, psychoanalyst Carl Jung uh, talks about the shadow, um, and he says to get the shadow for me is, and I guess for you is whatever that was driving that not enough. There was something maybe from our childhood or whatever, but there was something driving that always in our background, making us feel not enough. Uh, and the only way to get rid of it is to bring it to the front and confront it. Um, right. And yeah, so I feel you, and it, you, like you said, you may never, I may never get rid of it completely, but I can always bring it to the front. And when it's in the front, it's no longer driving me. I'm driving and it's there. Kind of like an intrusive force, just bring yeah, it to yeah. the front. And, and you can kind of do that fake it. Like, you know, when I'm directing, I mean, there's not a moment where I don't go, you loser, but I have to pretend I know what I'm doing. Yeah. So you know, amazingly, when you start to do it and you're looking at, you know, 150 people on the crew and all this equipment's there and you're going, you're, you could absolutely have a panic attack. And, but I go, I've got to get through this first shot. So I, so you make a decision, you sound confident, you listen. I, I do all the things that I go, how do I get through this first shot? And then somehow you get through it and you go, Oh, I got through the first shot. And then you do the second shot and then you get through the first day. And then if you get through that first day, you go, Oh, maybe I can do a second day. And then a weird thing happens after about a week in, you start to go, oh, I'm actually directing this movie. But I've been faking it for a week. Yeah. You know, like, so, so I, because I've got, because I have to out of necessity, because otherwise, what are they going to do? You know? So I think the same thing can be applied for, like, if you don't think you're good enough. Well, if you, if you're forced to say, I, 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 I'm, I am good enough, whether I believe it or not, after a while, you start to go, yeah, maybe, actually, maybe I am okay. Or maybe I am good enough. That always blows me away. Is when I, if ever I finish a movie directing, I go, I cannot believe I just directed that movie. 
because it just seems so Herculean and impossible. And like, why is anyone going to listen to you? And you know, who are you to tell people to do this or how about this or you know, act this way or you know? Uh, so that I find that that as a really huge thing to be able to get through that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and every time you get through that process, do you find that? Um, you've almost, I don't want to say disproved yourself, but get, you've got a little more evidence now that I did that, so I am good enough in the sense yeah. direct. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you can't, it's like every time you do something that's, it's like every time you do a podcast, you must go, oh, that's another one. A little, there's a little bit more, there's another sliver of, yeah. a little bit more, you know, and then you, you just, you have to, yeah, like every time I write another script or I get to another thing, I go, oh, that's more experience. I did okay, and you and you can't go, well, I didn't do that, hmm. you know. But, but most people never even would do. It. They don't write the script or they don't direct because they're scared. So then they're that's they're, that's hopeless because because you're, there's no proof that you can actually do it, and because you're fearful of it, and you don't go through it, then you can never prove to yourself that you can do it. But by doing it and going through it yeah it slowly starts to chip away at those initial things that we're talking about like wanting to be loved or wanting to put a mark on or am i good enough and all that stuff and you're kind of what you're really doing is proving to yourself i am good enough in a weird way like me making movies and you doing this podcast are sort of these very commercial ways and social ways of going like hey i'm you know i'm here i'm alive i you know i you know it's you know but that's rare not most people don't do that uh, yeah yeah i guess it can go too far as well the other way of i need to keep doing this to, to, to kind of make sure i'm enough but it's i think the thing realize i've had is each one does give me a learning like you know oh you know i am i can talk to people whatever or i am good enough etc um i'm losing my point here uh but it can go the other way is as long as I, I'm not doing it to kind of prove that I'm enough, I'm doing it because I still enjoy it and love it, then the, the it becomes evidence of, yeah. I guess I didn't want people to latch onto that and be like, I need to overachieve to feel good enough. because the well, thing, That's yeah. another great point. Again, it's balance. Because yeah. I, anything, yeah. I mean, it's a thing for certainty. You go, well, then if I just work hard enough and do something, I'll be, no, because you, you can go the other way and it can be, become a nightmare. Yeah. Like you have to, you go, you know, why am I doing this? Well, you, I know you're not, I'm not, that's a byproduct. I know like you didn't set out to do, you know, OCD stories because you go, oh, that's going to put me on the map. You had a genuine interest in Definitely it. Definitely not, yeah. Because you, you were dealing with it yourself and yeah. you go, oh, this could be helpful. I have a passion to do it. And then the, the natural byproduct is just like the natural byproduct of me. I enjoy writing. I like stories. This is that people watch it and people, and then the business comes into it. Yeah. But I'm doing it because that's something I really enjoy doing. You can't say, oh, I'm going to be a tennis pro. I hate tennis, but I'm going to do it because at the end I'm going to be on, I'm going to have a commercial, on, yeah. a night commercial. Well, you can't because you don't have the desire to be a tennis player in the first place. So how are you going to get there? So by the same token, so if you're doing it for the wrong, and then you start to push it too far. I see people all the time who do get successful, and then they do get sucked in, and they try to make, you know, they, I want more success, and, and then they implode. Because they're going after the wrong thing and they're back to where they started from, which is, you know, I'm going to try and, you know, create something for the end product. And that just, you can't do it. They're chasing someone that's empty, right? It's not, yeah. there's no, no meat to it. Um, yeah, it's like people who want to be famous for famous sake. It's like, it's, it's going to be unfulfilling. It's very unlikely that life is going to fulfill hardly anyone um, unless, it's, unless it's famous doing what they love. Which could or, be. They'll, or they'll become famous in a quick way doing the wrong thing hmm. and it'll be very short-lived which i see a lot yeah and then they're and then they come crashing down hard which is for the most part that's what happens here which is you know if you're a good actor you're a good writer you learn your craft yeah and you know what you're talking about you know you have a better chance of having a longer successful career if you're in a reality show you get a lot of instant <laughs> Success. I mean, those guys fall off the, you know, the, mm -hmm. they explode, they kill themselves, they have disaster because mm -hmm. it's not based on it. It's just based on, I, I just want success. And that by itself cannot sustain. No. I mean, yeah, maybe for a minute, but geez, I wouldn't, uh, you're, it's a real risk to go after that illusory, momentary. Yeah. You know, 
I see that all the time. Yeah, that no, makes sense. So it's kind of, yeah, chase something if it's aligned with your values, it's meaningful to you and you're interested in it. Um, and the thing that came out for me in therapy, when I had that realization, it was because of the OCD camp, actually, that it was a real emotional weekend. And, and then in therapy, it hit me that I could just, I just came out and said, you know, no, I am, uh, what was it? Oh, I am proud of myself. And it wasn't, and it wasn't just, I'm proud of myself because of this achievement. That's what helped me come to the realization along with therapy. But in that moment, I also said, and I've always been enough. I, I've all, I'm proud of myself, even when that kid I, who I've hated on for two years in therapy, which is me, by the way. Um, yeah. I now realize that he was always enough. And it was that kind of, you know, before he ever did anything, quote unquote, good by society standards, he was already enough. Yeah. And, and, and it took, yeah. So it's. It, it doesn't, whether you did this or not. Yeah. You know, this whole pot, the whole thing you're doing. I mean, look, I've seen every re top researcher, doctor, university professor. I mean, you wouldn't believe the litany of people I've seen. I've learned more from just listening to you over the years than any of those guys combined. So I go, that's really meaningful. Now, whether, but whether you did it or not, you know, if I just met you and you said, oh, yeah, I'm doing, you know, it, I would have had the same kind of, I went, oh, this is a good guy. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's thoughtful. He talks well. He can communicate. And it wouldn't change that much. I, I'm just going to buy projects. I go, oh, I, I had all, all this information under one roof. That I otherwise so it didn't affect like how I went. Oh, Stu's a good guy. I like Stu. I just go. Oh, thank God he had. A, he, I, now I don't have to do all this research because he just. But I don't go. Oh, he's this magic guy because he did this. Mm. The effort that he did to do this makes me like him more. I wouldn't. I, I would have liked you the same way now or then. But I, it, it makes it easier for me because I don't have to do all that work because you've done it for me. But it has no bearing on that, that I, I go. Oh, would I want to go have dinner with with him? I mean, if you were a, a not a nice guy. I still wouldn't want to have dinner with you. But if I met you before or now, I go, oh, it'd be fun to hang out with you. And you just mm -hmm. sit around and you know, I feel comfortable with you and stuff. I go, that's, you've always had that. So that's kind of like, to me, kind of like peeling away all the layers of that. You know, whether you're, you know, I, I, you, you do this because it rubs off. I can see that you're, you know, you enjoy this world. So I enjoy it because I, I feel like it's real. Yeah. yeah thanks, man. I appreciate it. Sure um yeah all right so so a few more questions then um in sort of the the world of ocd recovery what was your biggest epiphany like was there a moment that something just clicked for you or along those lines yeah I, am i allowed to mention a guy who you've had on the yeah of course like it's, uh, in a weird way mark freeman what he said he said the search for it's the search for certainty that's the killer. And something about when, when he said that, I went, it just was like, it really was an aha moment because it, it took all this unfocused analyzation of what OCD was and it put it to this one thing. And I go, yes, it's all, in, it's all looking for certainty. Yeah. And then the other thing, which he had said on a personal thing, which he said, I think it was a thing with you too, is he said the things that drove him were three things. I think he said it was resources, um, something, something. He says everything's, and when he distilled it down to those three things and everything, that made me think of, oh, I never did that before. I never thought, what's the ab absolute, my core things? So those two things, that certainty thing, got me thinking in a different way. I mean, it was so weird because mm -hmm. I've been going down the CBT route of analyzing all my, each thought, which is an endless day of it's a compulsion as well. It was crazy. I had like, you know, 500 pages a day. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And I go, I can't do this and it's not helping. And then when I heard that, I went, I don't have to do that anymore. I'm, not, I'm looking, I'm shining the light on the wrong thing. Yeah. So that was a real turnaround for me. So then I started listening to him and then listening to you. And then, and, the, and those two were two connections that I started to weed out. So when you would have someone on that was more like in that line of thinking, I started to tailor my watching to those things. As opposed to just listening to someone who I knew was going to talk about something I didn't, I didn't feel it was. Yeah. So that was my, that was my aha moment. Okay, cool. No, that's a good one. Um, yeah, absolutely. I love that line of thinking. So, yeah. I guess, what would you tell someone who's just going down the road of uh, recovery or treatment for OCD? 
I, know gonna, I, I would say, you know, I'd say watch OCD stories. Thank you. Because I think you get a very quick education. And, and so you can, you, just from a sheer standpoint of, you can understand what's going on in a very, under one roof, as opposed to, you know, if you start, like I remember when I first started research, there was very little around. And you just get confused. And so you're, you get more confused, creates more anxiety, and you don't know where to turn. And so once, you know, when I saw those things, I mean, I got a real education. And they're like, oh, I didn't know ACT, ERP, oh, this, this, like things that made sense. Yeah. And I could kind of compare and contrast each one. And because you were sort of the anchor man of all of them, so you kept asking, this, like you would ask, well, oh, does, does this feed into this? So you kept it sort of on one line, so it, which is the way sort of the viewer, like I would look at it. Yeah. So I kept saying, oh, I'm glad he asked that because that's what I'm thinking. How does that have to do with this? And so after watching enough of them, I sort of understood the whole world, which was my ammunition to go, okay, I don't have to be terrified of this. This is what it is. So for someone who's just starting, I would say educate yourself. Like look at it like a course. Watch one a night or two a night, whatever you want to do. And make it like a habit. And, you know, in a week, you'll start to go, oh, I, I'm starting to get this. And then it, after a couple of weeks, you're going to go, oh, here's the. And it's not that there's only a few things. It really is not that much to it. This is a few different techniques. There's general things that are repeated over and over. And then, and then it's suddenly all the danger of what's going on dissipates. And now you can grab that tiger by the tail and hang on a little bit. That would be my biggest piece of advice. I really, I haven't seen a better resource than this. No, I appreciate it. that. Means a lot. Um, yeah, and I like the the, the tiger metaphor um, or analogy. So, what would you say so if you could call up the twenty year old Harris? Would he still be in Toronto? Uh, not Toronto, Canada at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he would. Have been. Yeah. Um, oh, what would you call him and tell him? I would have said, "Don't move to LA." <laughs> I said, I would have said, stay in Canada, do it from Canada. And I would have said, you need to tackle this now. Mm. Don't, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't back then. I just, I, 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 I sought comfort in my OCD. Um, and just, and it just kept getting, and I remember someone way back then said, you know, as you get older, you become a caricature of yourself. And I said, what does that mean? He says, as you get older, your anxiety is going to get worse. Your OCD is only going to get worse. It doesn't stay at the status quo. It grows like everything else. Mm -hmm. So if you don't deal with it now, by the time you're older, it's, it may be too big for you to ever change. And I said, oh, what are you talking about? I, I, I'll deal with it later. And he was so dead on. But there's something about youth. You know, youth is wasted on the young because by being young, you don't go, you go, why didn't I do that? <laughs> Because you hadn't been hit hard enough yet. Yeah. So I need like kind of the breakdown to go, whoa, I have to do something. So I would I would have said, you know, start action now before it gets out of hand. And I didn't do that. Yeah, I think it's a really good piece of advice. And that's something that's been dawning on me recently because I, I guess I'm privileged in the sense of, yes, I talk to lots of cool people, and but it's, it's the emails I get and the other conversations I have with people that – and near enough in all of their stories, the moment they sought help was when the moment they couldn't take it any longer, when they had hit kind of rock bottom. And I thought, what a, I'm fascinated by why as humans, we wait to the point where we, our lives are starting to become ruined because of this. Instead of thinking, actually, this is making me anxious. It's starting to bother me a bit. I'm just going to go seek treatment now and help before it's robbed me of everything. Um, that, that to me completely perplexes me. But I think as a writer, because I spend so much time by creating characters, I actually think it may be the human condition. Hmm. It's just it, because otherwise, why wouldn't you just learn from other people's mistakes before it even happens? You go, that's never going to happen to me. I mean, you can do it to some extent. Yeah. But there's something about you. If you don't feel the pain, it doesn't make you, you know, it's the weirdest thing. Um, but that's a that's a big question. I'd have to same share the yeah. same thing. Why didn't I see that earlier? And go, I don't know. I should have. Like, what have I? So, but I, I don't know why. I suppose, yeah. I guess because we're primarily emotional. We're not logical. We are logical, but we're not. Uh, what was it? Um, 
Spock in Star Trek, his race of people, they're, they're from, I'm not really a big Star Trek fan, but from what I know, his race of people are very logical. They do everything because of logic. So yeah. they probably would never get to the point as us humans do, because as soon as it affects them a little bit, they deal with it. Whereas because we're not driven by solely logic, we're driven by emotion. We wait for us to feel utterly crippled emotionally before we feel inspired to do something. Yeah, although although there are natural, like you don't go out, and, you know, you might want, if you're driving in traffic and you want to kill someone, you don't kill them. <laughs> so I go, so why, so you don't, do, you don't follow so there that. There is logic, you know? yeah. So I go, why can't you do that with yourself? But okay, I think when yeah. it's something to do with your mental state like that, it's, it's not, I don't know, that's a, such a good question. Why don't you address it? Or Maybe some people do, by the way, but, you know, I don't know. It's a, I wish I had an answer to that, but that, that's something that's completely flabbergasts me. Maybe there's a script there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I always put stuff like that in the characters, like why do they do things and why don't they do things and that's what resonates but it's really just my own fear and regret you know yeah that's what's funny about these movies is i always sneak in my own personal ocd stuff in these characters which make the scripts readable because people go oh i see myself in them but i have to put make them make these huge characters in order to sell yeah so it's, it's just i might even tell you this in the last podcast which is you know i'm I'm sneaking in what I really want to say in these big characters, which ironically give them depth, which is why, you know, a lot of these Marvel movies and stuff are hard to watch because it was very one. You know. Yeah. There's not a lot of uh, <coughs> backstories or yeah. Good characters in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So that kind of wraps us up. Um, thank you as always for coming on Harris. I love I love doing it. If it helps like half a person, I'd be thrilled. You know? no, no, no doubt it will. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Harris. And a quick disclaimer: this podcast is not therapy. It's not a replacement for therapy, and nor should it be. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care.